بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم أما بعد حبيت في الله we reach the ninth nullifier uh, which Sheikh Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahab rahimahullah ta'ala said At-Tasi' Man i'taqida anna ba'd al-nasi yas'ahu al-khuruju an shariyati Muhammadin sallallahu alayhi wa sallam kama wasi'a al-khida al-khuruju an shariyati Musa alayhi salatu wa sallam fuhuwa kafir liqawlihi ta'ala وَمَنْ يَبْتَغِي غَيْرِ الْإِسْلَامِ دِينَ فَلَنْ يُقْبَلَ مِنْهُ وَهُوَ فِي الْآخِرَةِ مِنَ الْخَاسِرِينَ سورة آل إمران آية 85 شيخ محمد ابن رضو حاب رحمه الله تعالى he said the ninth nullifier anyone who believes that some people are exempt from following the legislation of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam just as Khidr was exempt from following the legislation of Musa alayhi salatu wasallam has disbelieved so this means that anyone who believes that they are exempt or that they do not have to follow the sharia of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam that this is kufr to think that they are above the sharia and we're going to get into some of the examples so we'll get right into uh, the explanation here the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was sent to all mankind in the jinn which distinguished him Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam from previous messengers and prophets Alayhim Afdal Salatu Wasallam and this is from the uniqueness of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and this makes it a necessity for all mankind to follow his sunnah that means now that it is impingent it is an obligation upon us to follow the sunnah of who? Of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam And that we don't follow Jesus alayhi salatu wa sallam. And we don't follow Musa alayhi salatu wa sallam. And we don't follow any of the Anbiya except for those things which of course would be Tawheed and those uh, issues of Ittiqad which are in accordance with what the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was sent with. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions that all the messengers were sent with Tawheed. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَلَقَدْ بَعَثْنَا فِي كُلِّ أُمَّةً رَسُولًا إِنْ نَعْبُدُ اللَّهَ وَجْتَنِبُوا تَعْبُودُ That we sent to every nation a messenger to worship Allah alone and avoid the ta'bud, avoid those things which are worshipped besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is the sunnah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the sunnah of His Anbiya, alayhim afdal salatu salam. They were all sent with the same message of tawheed that never before did Allah legislate worshiping other than Him? It was always the messages were sent. The messengers were sent with Tawheed. They were sent with the worship of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala alone. So for us, that message carries on, as well as all of the legislation that Muhammad Alayhi Salatu Salam came with. Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala says, "And we have sent not, uh, and we have not sent you except as a giver of glad tidings, and one who warns." to all mankind, but most men know not. And this is in Saba, uh, verse uh, 28. Allah also says, Say, O mankind, verily I am sent to you all as a messenger of Allah. And this is uh, Surah uh, Sur uh, Al-A'raf, uh, verse uh, 158. So in these two uh, ayah, or ayat, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes clear that the Messenger والسلام, was sent for all of mankind. Those two verses illustrate for us what? They are Dalil and evidence for what? That the Prophet والسلام, was sent to all of mankind, not just to the Quraysh, not just to a certain people, although he started his call with his people. He started with his call with his, uh, his immediate, his tribe, and those around him. And that's how the message spread and the message was for all of mankind though. The Prophet والسلام, said, Prophets used to be sent to a particular people, but I was sent to all of mankind. 
The Prophet wasallam also said, by the one whose hand Muhammad's soul is in, there is not a Jew or Christian who hears about me and then dies without believing in what I was sent with, except that he will be from the people of the hellfire. Meaning that Ahl Kitab, if they do not follow what Muhammad وسلم, came with, the message of Islam, that they are the, from the Hasidin, that they are from the people, the losers, meaning they lose in this life as well as the hereafter, and their loss in the next life is the hellfire eternally. The Prophet saw Umar uh, bin al Khattab and in his hand was a page of the Torah, the, the, the book of the Yahud of the Jews. So he admonished him. He said, O son of Khattab, O son of Al-Khattab, I have been sent to you with that which is pure and white, meaning the Quran and the Sunnah. Uh, if Musa was alive, he would not be commanded to do anything except follow me. Then Umar radiallahu said, we are pleased with what Allah, we are pl pleased with Allah as our Lord, and Islam is our religion, and Muhammad as our prophet and messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So this shows us that even though Umar was uh, looking in the Torah, which is the book, of, the people of the book, it was their book, it was a book from the previous messengers, alayhim afdal salatu wa salam, but the Prophet alayhi salatu wa salam commanded him to refrain from that, and that he was sent for all of mankind and his message abrogates what the other MBA uh, came with from their Sharia, from their laws and legislations. The scholars uh, disagree over whether Khidr was a prophet or a saint. And according to the evidences, the most correct opinion is that he was a prophet. Khidr met Musa and they both were prophets and received revelation and possess certain knowledge Allah has bestowed upon them. Therefore, Khidr was not sent to the children of Israel, Israel like Musa, but sent to his own people with a different set of commandments. Uh, Sheikh uh, uh, Abdulaziz al Rais states, it was necessary for Khidr to follow him. This is because the messengers were sent with specific laws, except our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, uh, whose message was general. Another point uh, Sheikh uh, Abdulaziz al Rais mentioned was that the things of Khidr did, uh, did the things Khidr did were not in uh, a contradiction to the laws of Musa alayhi salatu wasalam. And he did not know the reasons behind Khidr's actions, and when it was made clear to him, he agreed to them. So this was the case of Khidr with Musa alayhi salatu wasalam, meaning that uh, Khidr did not transgress the bounds of the Sharia of Musa alayhi salatu wasalam. And because he had his own commandments, and likewise what he did was not a contradiction. Because this is what the some of the people of Bid'ah and desires, especially from uh, some of the extreme Sufi sects, they try to use this hujja, they try to use as evidence that Khidr did not follow the exact commandments of Musa alayhi salatu wasalam, as evidence that their sheikhs do not have to follow the exact sunnah of the Prophet وسلم, or in fact any of the sharia, that they can negate it. And some of the examples, some of the contemporary examples, you have people like some of these uh, so-called Sheikh Shirk uh, Nazim or Sheikh Nazim and other people like this from extreme Sufis that are in the West, I believe in the, in, in the United States and in Europe. And some of these guys claim they don't even have to pray anymore. They do everything, um, not just mix with females, but do everything. Some of them even have relations to such an extent, true stories, that when I was in Hadramot, uh, speaking to one of the senior students of knowledge in the Dara Hadith in Sheher, and he mentioned that their ajdad, meaning their grandfathers and so forth, you know, they were extreme Sufis and they used to bring, and this was in Hadramot, that they used to bring before their wives, uh, before they would Get, you know, when they were going to marry a woman, that they would have to bring the woman to the village sheikh, and basically him to christen her. Why? How did he do this? By having relations with her. Then 
you guys could have relations. You could, you know, solidify your nikah. So it shows us how much misguidance some of the people had had uh, went to with in and and claiming Islam that they even went to the extent of lessening their own honor and transgressing all bounds to where it was more of the sunnah of those people who wife swap or something to this effect instead of the sunnah of Muhammad sallallahu so their so called sheikh made zina mubah lahu made it permissible for him and for the bride and amongst all the other shirkiyat that they did of you know having graves in the the masajid believing that this person was from uh, the only of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala perhaps uh, uh, supplicating to them you know seeking their blessings their blessings would come by having relations with their their wives so it shows you the misguidance that the people uh, uh, have 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 went upon and that there are people of misguidance to the extreme levels to the extreme extent, extent that they would uh, initiate these kind of practices claiming it in the name of Islam and claiming that they are above the Sharia of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and one of the other things in the verse where Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala says وَعْبُدُ اللَّهَ حَتَّى يَأْتِيُكُمْ يَقِينٌ so these people of misguidance have reached a level in which they have transgressed the bounds of Islam with their shirkiyat, with making zina permissible for them, and distorting the verses of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and worship your Lord until you reach certainty. So they take that to mean that certainty, that yaqeen, for them, that means that they only have to worship Allah until they feel they have reached a level of Iman, a certain strong level of Iman, and that they are now above petty acts of Salat, Zakat, Hajj. In fact, they can, they're not restrained by time, so they can make Hajj any time, meaning the Hajj for them, the Hajj for uh, normal Muslims, for the, for the Ummah of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, happens during the holy months, but for these people, Hajj can be year-round. Because they بَلَغَ yaqeen, كَمَا قِيلْ كَمَا زَعَمْ They say they have reached certainty, and this is according to their false claims of bid'ah and zambaka and kufr wa ilhad. Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah and al-Qadi Iyad both mentioned that there is a consensus that leaving the Sharia of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam is disbelief. Some of the doubtful matters raised by some sects pertaining to this issue, and this this goes back to what we said. Ibn Hazm mentioned this. Ibn Hazm said a group amongst the Sufis, so this was in his time, claims that there is a group of awliya, friends or saints of Allah the Almighty who are better than all the messengers and prophets they say whoever reaches the pinnacle of sainthood then all the Sharia is non applicable to him from Salat fasting alms or charity and other duties therefore it is permissible to do all the prohibited things like adultery and alcohol etc and they seek to make enjoying unlawful women permissible for them and they say because we see Allah and speak to him and whatever emanates from our hearts is the truth subhanallah if this is not dalal mubin then we can't we won't even be able to distinguish what is dalal and haq these people have went to the ultimate level of kufr and negating Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's sharia and saying that they are above it and transgressing and making istihlal of the of the, the, of, the, of, the of, of sins meaning they have made it lawful to commit a zina 
lawful to drink alcohol. They can smoke hashish. They can do whatever they want. They can enjoy women from wherever they want or probably other than that. Wa'iyadhan billah. And they say this is because they have reached a level of sainthood or a level of love. They've reached such a love with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that they can do whatever they want and they're forgiven. Wa'iyadhan billah. Min kufr wa shirk wa dalal. Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah said regarding this sect, this sect of Sufis, from this group is those who use the saying of Allah and worship your Lord until you reach certainty, yaqeen, as we mentioned. And they say it means worship your Lord until you reach knowledge and understanding. And if one achieves that, worship is no longer necessary. Some of them say, strive until you achieve a certain state and you and if you reach a certain state of mysticism, then you are not responsible for worship. Some of these people believe that if you reach that certain level of understanding and state, then it is permissible to leave the obligatory acts and commit the prohibited. So this shows you that these were ancient uh, beliefs of kufr and ilhad. And that you should not be surprised if you, run, if you go to a, some of the masajid in America some of this misogyny in the UK, some of the misogynists throughout Europe and in the Arab world and around the world, and you find some of the extreme Sufis, those who have dhikr circles and turn off the lights and dance, uh, the men and women together, closing their eyes, saying Allahu, Allahu, and all kind of things with their false itiqad that they have with this, that goes along with this, that they make ta'zim of their sheikhs to such a level, they, they exalt their sheikhs to such a level that it's a level of ibadah. And they will tell you our sheikh is so and so and he is on such a high level. They will pull out pictures of their scholars and they will cry. And if they don't cry then they feel sorrow that they haven't really reached, they don't have true taqwa because true taqwa is fearing their sheikh. That in the depths of the night they should fear their sheikh and cry to their sheikh. And these kind of uh, attributes and types of worship only belong to Allah Azza wa Jal. They only belong to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We don't even do that with the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. Some of the... Uh, so, those sects, as we mentioned, uh, that exploit the fact that Khidr did not follow Musa alayhi salatu salam, believe that it is also permissible for their saints to lead the Islamic bounds of the Quran and the Sunnah, and this is a nullification of one's faith. So this is how they negate their faith. This is how they, they reach the level of kufr and ilhad. Uh, some of the implications uh, of this naqid min nawaqid al-Islam. Some of the implications of this. Number one, that people who do this and believe that they are not bound by the sharia, it implies that one is better than the Prophet وسلم, and his companions who observe the Sharia limits and that the saints have achieved a level of worship and understanding that they did not gain. So the person who practices this and believes this, this ittaqad, this creed, this aqidah, that means that they are implying that they know better than the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, and his companions and that they have uh, reached a level of worship and a level of status with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala which is greater than the Prophet because what did the Prophet do? He prayed Salat al-Khams the five daily prayers and Witr and Tahajit and uh, all this, these acts of Ibadah in the, in the Sunan the Prophet sought forgiveness in the depths of the night crying till his feet swelled Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam but these people don't have to pray. These people can have as many women as they want. These people can drink wine and, and enjoy what is supposedly the finer things in this life that are prohibited by Islam. And it shows you the dalal and the kufr. Uh, the second implication here is this creed involves making the unlawful lawful, which is open and clear disbelief. As we mentioned, it's the cloud. Third, the yaqeen implied in the verse refers to death. And that is agreed upon by the early scholars. So the Salaf, they held that this verse means or as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in the verse, 
that until you have reached certainty or yaqeen, that this means yaqeen here means death. This is what the Salaf understood. However, these people understand yaqeen to mean a certain level of sincerity, a certain level of worship, a, a high degree of worship that no one else can reach except for these certain individuals. The fourth point here, uh, from the belief of Ahl Sunnati wal Jama'ah, is that one who denies a ruling which is known from the religion by necessity, as we mentioned, ma'lum min adin bi in the beginning of our treaties, is a disbeliever and apostate. And his blood is lawful like the one who rejects the obligation of the clear compulsory duties which are well known or rejects the prohibition of that which is clearly forbidden and well known. As long as he is not ignorant or new to the religion of Islam or living in an isolated village surrounded by ignorance. This is one of the quotes of our ulama. This is a quote. Let's see if we can find the exact quote. Because it's in a footnote. This is from Mijmu'a Fatawa and Imam uh, uh, Ibn Qudama and al mughni Imam al uh, goes on to explain the criterion of those things known in the religion by necessity, meaning those things that, that I said before, ma'lum min al bi means that every, uh, that Muslims have a type of consensus that these things uh, are known in the religion and no one, except maybe someone who is absolutely new to the religion or something like this, should be ignorant of. Imam Noe said about the criterion of those things known in the religion by necessity when he said, Today Islam has become widespread and the Muslims have common knowledge. He's talking about the Muslims. Have common knowledge of the obligation of zakat. Even both the layman and the scholar know this. So no one is excused due to his misinterpretation by denying it. Likewise, whoever denies anything that the Muslim community has consensus upon related to the affairs of the religion and the knowledge of that obligation is widespread. Like praying five times a day, fasting Ramadan, making ghusl after sexual relations, the prohibition of fornication, alcohol, and marrying those prohibited to marry, and legislation similar to this. So he mentioned those, some of those uh, uh, issues as being things that are well known from the uh, uh, well known from the religion that no one has an excuse of ignorance of fasting the month of Ramadan, praying five times a day. No one who is a Muslim uh, should be ignorant of this. However, as I said, also that we made uh, a, a point of is that scholars do differ over some of those things which are ma'noum min adin bi because it's hard to reach an exact consensus on that because in certain times, in certain places that perhaps a people were not ever really delivered the correct message of Islam, that they had some, perhaps in some villages, even in India. Even in India you have Ahla Hadith, you have this, but that doesn't mean Ahla Hadith's knowledge was widespread over India. You had the Mughal Empire, which had all kind of various stages and various leaders who were not always uh, pious and not always, uh, you know, I'm not exactly familiar with the Aqidah, but I'm assuming that the Aqidah of most of the Mughal Empire was not the Aqidah of Ahl Sunnah with Jama'ah. So you had probably a mixing, as we have from some of the uh, some of the evidences from some of those leaders, that they basically were very close with the Hindus in their belief. And so, that being the case, that the knowledge of Islam was not of correct Islam and some of the pillars or, and some of the principles of Islam may have not been widespread and they may have been just co-adopting some of the pra practice of, of the, uh, the polytheistic uh, communities. And then therefore, that was not necessarily certain aspects may not have been ma'lum bin adin bi to those people. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. The fifth point here, Allah says, and say not that what your tongues have put forth falsely. This is lawful and this is forbidden. So as to invent lies against the law. Verily, those who invent lies against the law will never prosper. Uh, this is in Surah al nahl uh, verse 116. Ibn Kathir explains about this verse. Anyone who invents an innovation in Islam that has no origin in the Sharia fits into this verse or makes lawful something prohibited by Allah or prohibits something permissible based upon his opinion or his desire. Uh, Sheikh Ashanqiti said regarding this verse, 
Success is not totally negated in entirety except for the person who has no good and he is a disbeliever. So this shows us that uh, what we learn from this verse and those statements of those ulama like uh, in the tafsir of Ibn Kathir, the tafsir of uh, Sheikh uh, Muhammad uh, Amin al-Shanqiti rahimahullah jami'an is that from bid'ah the point of uh, when a person makes bid'ah they innovate in the religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that their bid'ah in general affects the act that they did bid'ah in it does not negate all of their actions unless they have bid'ah mukaffara the bid'ah which takes you out of the fold of Islam so if they've done an innovation which means they are no longer a Muslim like worship making supplicating to the dead supplicating to uh, the Prophet sallallahu asking his forgiveness asking for him to help your wife uh, have a baby these kind of things this is shirk this is pure and open shirk or seeking blessings from trees and statues and things like this this is clear kufr which t this is a bid'ah and a kufr which takes you out of the fold of Islam this negates all of your other actions you know especially if there is no excuse of jahil for those ulama that say that there is an excuse for jahil for those uh, some of those issues of tawheed and like this uh, so if a person meaning that a person if they've done bid'ah mukaffara they've done a bid'ah which takes them out of the fold of Islam and they are out of the fold of Islam that the hujjah the proof has been established against them then that negates all of their deeds it negates everything because they're no longer a believer in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala but if it's bid'ah غير mukaffara, which means bid'ah which does not take you out of the fold of Islam for example some hizbi practices uh, some practices of calling uh, you know uh, starting new groups and sects uh, or whatever the case may be as long, if it is some newly invented matter in the religion that does not take you out of the fold of Islam then this uh, of course doesn't take you out of the fold of Islam and this does not negate all of your actions but it negates the action that you did the bid'ah in okay if you begin a new uh, for example in your salat you pray an extra rakah okay uh, thinking that this is going to bring you closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala this is a bid'ah uh, in the, in your salat it makes your salat batil it invalidates your prayer so this would invalidate your prayer but that would have ne not necessarily have effect on the zakat you paid or other good actions you've done but this negates the action that you've done the bid'ah in and I hope that's clear in the ta'ala the sixth point, whoever claims that he or the leader of his sect is more knowledgeable than the messengers about reality and better in making it clearer than them, then he is a zindiq, an apostate, hypocrite, even if he illustrates apparent belief in them. And this is according to the consensus of the believers. This is also, this statement is a statement of, uh, that you'll find from Sheikh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah in his Majmur of Fatawa. So this illustrates the fact that these actions and beliefs of extreme individuals and sects who do not observe the boundaries of the Sharia uh, are in fact in disbelief and apostasy due to their nullification of Islamic law. They're committing shirk in both worship and lordship and their general belief that they are above the Sharia uh, and no longer responsible for its tenets. So this is in the way those examples of those extreme Sufis who hold those kind of beliefs saying they're no longer restricted or their imams or their scholars are no longer restricted or their saints are no longer restricted by the Sharia and they can do whatever they want this has this is a negation of Aqidah of Ahl Sunnah this is a negation of uh, this is shirk in the Tawheed of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with regards to worship uh, especially if they are doing committing shirk and and, and so forth and this is a, a an actual violation of the Lordship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, they're violating the laws of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and as if they are uh, attributing lordship to them or their their uh, awliya or their their, uh, their 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 imams or their scholars وَعِيَاذٍ بِاللَّهِ وَإِيَّاكُمْ مِنْ ذَلِكَ ضَلَالٍ وَمِنْ كُفْرٍ and we ask Allah the Almighty to accept our good and forgive our evil.